As you probably know by now, we're moving, and we have so many great courses in the Wood Whisperer Guild that we can't possibly move with all of that digital inventory. So that's why we're having a huge limited time sale of 50% off in the Wood Whisperer Guild. Projects released in 2022 are excluded, but any other project on the site is 50% off using the code SUMMERFUN. Now there's a limit of two per person, and the sale ends on June 5th, so don't miss out. The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Typebond. So I have to apologize for not giving you guys an update sooner, but so much has transpired since the whole foreclosure scare that there's no way I'm dragging you guys through the mud with me. To be honest, this experience has really sucked so far. Yes, we but it is a self-inflicted wound and I'm really not looking for anyone's pity, though I do appreciate it. So I will keep you up to date, but I'm only going to summarize events and keep the drama to a minimum for your sake and mine. So the whole foreclosure thing actually turned out to be a pre-foreclosure and we were able to get the deal back on track at least temporarily. Yeah! Drama, drama, drama. It soon became clear that this deal was starting to stink like horse poop. So we galloped out of there as fast as possible. Unfortunately, there just aren't a whole lot of options on the market for the kind of property we're looking for right now. And they come up slowly. It would just take time to find what we needed. Uh, so at this point, with time not on our side, we needed a new plan. A version of our setup that we've toyed with over the years, and I'm sure a lot of you have already thought about this, is a separation of the residents from the business. Now, that's just a whole new paradigm for me. It's not something I'm used to. Since 2006, I've been working in a home attached or uh, detached on my property sort of situation with my shop. And the idea of having a commercial property is a very new concept full of pros and cons. But the good thing is it would open up a whole lot of options in terms of what house we can get. If you don't have to have that property and you don't need to have that big old shop on the property, suddenly the menu of options widens up a little bit. But at this point, time isn't on our side. So we hopped back in the car and headed out to look at more properties after we did this. And this. And some of this. Well, let's, let's go get the real Dougie. Where's the, where's the real Dougie? Our dog. Oh, yeah. So we actually did see some promising properties in both the resident side of things as well as the commercial. And we made offers on one of each. And we don't know what's going to happen yet. As of today, we still don't know. So sit tight and I will keep you guys posted on that. Oh, by the way, you remember that contract that we had on our house here in Denver that was so easy? Well, that fell apart. And then another one came in and that one fell apart. So we're now on our third contract, no fault of ours. It's just people not doing enough research and don't know what they're getting into. But we are now on a third one that seems to be very stable and moving forward and we're hitting our deadlines. So fingers crossed, at least on this side, hopefully we won't have to worry about the house sale and can just focus on the purchase side of things. So now back to the shop teardown, we have two faux walls that need to come down in preparation for garage door opener installation. Let's get to it. All right, so you might recall one of my goals is to dismantle these two uh, faux walls that are in place. Um, now, before I do that, I really need to be strategic. So if you look over here, I've got a lot of crap over in that corner, but I was able to actually sell two tools and these will have replacements when we get where we're going, but look at all the extra space that I've gained now. And that's gonna be super important for staging things as I break them down from other parts of the shop. Now, speaking of selling tools, that actually brings up a really good question. And I've had people ask me this in the past because I've actually sold tools before the move knowing that I wanted to upgrade to something else or change to a different brand when I got where I was going. It's not always the most economical thing to do, but in some cases, depending on how far you're going, maybe depending on how long you need to store those tools, if you have a transition period, it actually might be more economical to offload them first and then replace them when you get where you're going. Uh, but not always the case. So in my case here, I'm not really going to do that with many things. These were two tools that I was already in the process of replacing. Just makes sense to find a buyer for them here instead of dragging them across the country and then selling them. So, um, you know, but it is definitely something you want to consider because it might help you with the move. And before monkeying around with anything over here, I really need to think about where stuff is going to go, right? I have that center area of the floor, but I'm looking at a corner and I foresee a problem here. It's already getting packed in with stuff. There's overflow from the house that's ending up out here. And I could see myself kind of blocking this corner over time and still having to remove the cyclone. So while that's not something I would normally attack first in my particular situation, I think that cyclone needs to go, which means I got to get all this crap out of the way. Once that corner is done, then I could say, cool, I can start stacking things in that corner for the movers to pick up. So yeah.
Look at that beast. It's really, really high too. Got to get it down. Who's the only one here who knows the illegal ninja moves from the government? So here's a quick tip for you. If you're ever disassembling a big switch like this and you're an electrical noob like me, do yourself a favor and take a photo so that you know how to put it back together later. So two safety things to think about. Uh, you know, we're not getting any younger. And those of us who have had back injuries in the past or maybe chronic back injuries, you tend to be very protective of your back. And right now my back feels great. I have no problems with it. But to keep reminding myself that I do have a somewhat fragile back and I need to be careful, I'm actually wearing one of these little <laughs> pelt thingies. I'm not even really counting on it to support my back. I'm counting on it to be a reminder. I know it's here and whenever I go to pick something up, I go, why am I wearing this? Oh, that's right, because my back sucks. And then I pick up things properly. And I also remember to use tools to help me when I think my back might be at risk. So this bad boy is my new best friend. It's a material lift. Now I used one of these rented from Home Depot to hang this cyclone where it is. And I thought it would come in handy to get the cyclone back down. I've also used this to hang dust collection ductwork. So if you have big long sections of ductwork, just throw it on these arms, crank it up. It's fantastic. I actually purchased this one because I know I'm gonna need this well, for the rest of my woodworking career. And this thing is about a thousand pound capacity. It's very capable of moving just about anything I need to move in the shop. Sometimes you just have to come up with creative ways to make it work for what you're trying to do. So I'm gonna take this initial line of ductwork down and then I'm gonna figure out how to get that beast down safely. So the trick here is that the forks are not wide enough. The space between them will not accommodate the diameter of the cyclone. So my thought is it might be a little bit, you know, cockeyed when it gets in there, but I actually have some room to put one fork into the inlet to get that all the way inside. And then this guy is going to kind of grab onto the side of the housing. The good thing is I could sort of take the weight off, start lifting and evaluate if it seems like it's going to be safe or not and I could always back off and try something else uh, if it doesn't work. This actually worked surprisingly well. Because the legs are so long, I can only get the forks in so far. So once the cyclone was lifted off the wall mount, it was a little bit off balance. So I just have to hop up on a ladder and push the cyclone further onto the forks. And now you can see it's a lot happier as I bring it to the ground. From there, I was able to break it down into more manageable parts. Next up is the wall mount. By the way, I really like the height of the cyclone in this shop, so I just measured the height of the bracket and noted it on the bracket itself, since that's most likely a number that I'm gonna forget by the time I get where I'm going. Now, this corner is fair game for stacking stuff for the move. For some of these things, there's really not much packing to do. I just tidy up the cords and hoses and they'll go as is. And remember, any hollow container is a great storage opportunity. This dustbin will be filled with all kinds of stuff that I just don't feel like breaking down or packing in some other way. All right, that's a pretty good start. Now back over here, oh boy. So I think the mission here is gonna to be to empty the cabinets. And at this point, I think I could start to box things up. Um, there's no reason to take stuff out of cabinets and move them if they don't have homes, right? So I uh, gotta find a bunch of boxes, totes, whatever I could find just to start throwing that stuff in there. And then I could pull the cabinets away from the wall. And most of what I have in these cabinets over here is finishing supplies. The way I'm gonna pack these up is in totes. Now, of course, we could use cardboard boxes, but I think if you have totes, you're gonna be way better off. Uh, first of all, if there's any leaks for any of this stuff, being in a tote, it's gonna be contained. It's not gonna contaminate your you know, shipping containers or the truck it's in. Uh, I just think it's a lot safer. Um, the other reason is because totes 
have these really nice handles um, and they're much stronger. So if you have a lot of weight, which you will if you put a lot of liquid in there, it's going to be pretty heavy. Uh, plastic tote is going to be much more uh, durable and able to handle the weight. Another thing you might consider doing is actually running a little bit of packing tape over the top of the cans, the lids, things like that. It's just a little extra safeguard. I may not even do it on all of these. It'll, I'm sure it'll be fine. But if you're making a long trip or an extended trip, that might be something to consider. Now this stuff is a shop mover's secret weapon. Get yourself a roll, uh, get yourself a dozen rolls of stretch wrap. It's just amazing for being able to bundle small things together to keep them immobilized and safe, as well as to protect blades, maybe non-critical blades and things like my uh, grinder accessories here. So I've got a bunch of wheels that, you know, if they bump into each other, it's not the end of the world. They're pretty durable, but I really don't want them to get all messed up. So let's wrap them up. Got some loose parts. Well, you can kind of just put them in like that, and make them part of the bundle. Now, since these have to go in another container at some point, if you want, if you don't have that many, you could just wrap those together. And that's a nice little bundle that could be packed away in a box. Now I've got some of these open bins and organizers. These are interesting because you might be tempted to just throw that into a box or something. But if you have softer things that uh, aren't at risk of being damaged, you could always just use that as a holder for those things. Really pack it up good with soft things that aren't easily damaged. And then stretch wrap to the rescue. Now here's another secret weapon, potentially bubble wrap. I really think there are probably two types of woodworkers in this world. The type who will wrap every single tool. I mean, it really wouldn't take much, just a little bit of bubble wrap to provide some extra protection and then just kind of tape it and then gently place it into a box. And then there's the other group of people who's like, it's a tool, put it in a box, it'll be fine. I actually think I will probably start out as the bubble wrap guy and within a couple of days be the it, it's a tool kind of guy. So <laughs> start off with the best intentions. And most of us have hardware bins like this. Well, this is actually uh, quite nice because all you have to do, once again, stretch wrap around it and it's now a little self-contained thing. And uh, as long as it's not tipped around and pushed around, it should hold the hardware quite nicely. Now here's a tip that's really more common sense, especially if you've moved before, but when you're in your shop, sometimes common sense goes out the window and you have all these odd shaped things and you'll probably wind up with a lot of boxes that are only partially full. Uh, don't be tempted to just tape them up and put them in the pile. Leave them around, put them over to the side because eventually you're gonna find something to fill those empty voids with. Um, you know, things like this. Serenity. Though I think I may still need this for a few more days. I'm sure you already know you should be labeling your boxes, right? It's obvious, but if you have a cabinet, for instance, like this one where I just had a bunch of different things and I dumped them into a box, I don't want to really list everything that's in that box. I mean, I'm going to need to find it later, but come on, I'm not going to write every little thing. Well, here's one simple thing you can do. Chances are, you know what's in each of your cabinets without looking. So if you could say which cabinet it was, that will give you a clue. In my case, I've got a bunch of crap in this box. I don't care what it is because I know it's all of the stuff that was in my upper finishing cabinet. So when I get to the other side, um, I know where to find all that random stuff. So I don't know, works for me. Even though this space is a dedicated wood shop, I always have a couple of drawers full of stuff that are more related to the house. It's a good idea to mark something like that carefully. And I'm even gonna put the box with house stuff and this way I could find it easily when I get where I'm going. Depending on how you store them, transporting router bits can be really tricky. In my case, I use these foam inserts inside the drawers and that just allows me to lift them out and stack them in a box. And I could just add some filler on the top and they're good to go. For the screws, a smart man would either tape or stretch wrap each one, but I'm not a smart man, so I'll throw them in a box with enough stuff on top that it should keep most of the screws in their respective bins. And I'll put a note on the box to not store this thing on its side. The miter station itself should come apart pretty easily. By the way, if you're interested in building the miter station, it's a full project in the Wood Whisperer Guild, and we also have a free video that you can check out too. 
The top of the miter station is an eight foot length of double layered Baltic birch. I made it back when Baltic birch wasn't a thousand dollars a sheet. So it's pretty heavy and lifting it would be the exact body motion that causes me months of pain. So I think I'll use my new best friend, Lifty McLiftface. Now the upper cabinets really aren't that heavy, but there's nothing like an extra set of square metal hands to get them down without issue. Of course, the other indispensable tool when you don't have an assistant is the trusty hand truck. Yes. If it is, and speaking of assistance. Hey! Whoa. Can I be in the video? Look what I made. It's Donald Duck when he was about to fail in the Chippendale show. That looks like a great drawing. Nice job. Yeah. Nicely yeah, done. I went to show it to mom. Okay, we'll put it on the side. When mommy gets home, we'll look at it. Now, over the years, I've gotten a lot of questions about how I built these faux walls. Uh, what exactly I did. Well, it's not up to code. It's not a permanent structure. I never felt comfortable talking about it. So I'm not really considering this a recommendation, but I do want to give you a peek into how I did it in case you want to do something similar. I do think it's safe, but I also think it's temporary. And that was the whole idea. Funny thing was, I really had no intentions of moving, but I do like to think ahead on stuff like this. And I knew that one day if I did need to move and these walls need to come down, I would need to make them non-permanent. So uh, that's where this idea for how it's attached came about. So let me show you. So inside there is basically a two by four wall. I think I just went with the 16 inch on center spacing and then T111 siding all the way across. Uh, and if you look in the side here, you could see the side of the frame and that is all I did to attach it. So you see that little piece of two by four and an angle bracket and some screws that's going into, uh, you know, the garage door surround material there. Uh, you know, plenty of meat to bite into with the screws. This was actually really strong and it was very stable. Um, I did the sides up and down. It still wasn't totally stable until I actually secured it at the top. Now you can see over there that one is still intact. Again, just a little piece of, uh, you know, two by four, that angle bracket and that extra piece of this extra two by four here was supplemental. I had to add that so I had something to screw into without doing any damage or connecting it any way to the door itself. Now, I think you'll find this interesting. This middle one here, I've already removed the metal uh, right angle bracket and I want you to see how loose the wall is now. Okay, so this again, this is why I never really felt too comfortable encouraging people to do this because it's not a permanent installation, um, but it is now serving my needs because I knew I'd have to take it down one day. So I think the best way to handle this is to dismantle it in the reverse of how it was put together. I can't deal with the whole wall in one shot, that thing's too darn big. Um, so I'm probably gonna just take the skins off, get the electrical uh, out of there just to, to recover that stuff. The T111, I'm gonna save that. I, I definitely think I'm gonna be able to use that where I'm going and why waste it. So um, I will bring that with me. Uh, but the rest of the material in there is just you know two by four framing and some insulation. I think unfortunately, unless somebody wants to come get it, <laughs> I think it's going to have to go in a dumpster uh, and I may need to break it down in pieces because that's a big old wall and I can't handle it all in one shot. So I'm probably going to have to do some cutting uh, just to get parts of the wall down first in sections. So here we go. Whoa, look, it's my new shopping bag. You like that? So this bag here is pretty cool. It's called a bagster and it's a nice alternative to a standard dumpster if it's available in your area. It's Good job. Giant. It is giant. I was actually able to find a local guy that needed some insulation and 2x4s, so nothing was wasted. And I was able to keep some of the 2x4s for myself, as I'm sure I'll be able to use them in Missouri. Well, that's one of the most anticlimactic transformations I've ever seen. It's so boring, it looks terrible, but it's a garage. Uh, so now this space is clear, probably have to do a little bit more to clear stuff off the ceiling, make room for the garage door guys. Uh, actually still waiting for the garage door guys to call me back. I've got two 
uh, two different companies I'm, I'm waiting for an estimate from and I haven't heard from either of them. So hopefully we'll, we'll hear back soon. Um, but I do want to show you something interesting because I could not remember exactly how I had done this uh, several years ago and what I did to secure the doors uh, because there are no horizontal tracks here, right? So how is that door being held in place? You can see I still have the vertical track that's in place. So that is going to hold the door. But once you get to the top, there's nothing holding that in place. So at the very top there, what I wound up doing, and I didn't realize this until I started to remove that little guy. And I was like, oh crap, it's, you know, this whole top section here was getting ready to fold down. And this is, you know, it's a big heavy duty insulated door. And that's a, a two bay version of the door. So yeah, that could get pretty heavy. Um, and thankfully I caught it in time and then was able to just temporarily drive some lag bolts back in there to secure it in place until the pros get in here to do the job. All right, clamp wall. This could be a organizational nightmare uh, trying to get these things because they're just big and clunky. So I've got a few strategies. I don't know, there's probably better ways to do this too, but uh, let me show you a couple of the ways that I'm gonna handle this. Smaller lightweight clamps, like uh, the spring clamps. Uh, what do we have down here? The uh, quick clamps, those can all be boxed. Um, they're small enough, they're light enough, no problem with boxes but we've got some fairly large ones here. So what I will most likely do is pair these up and use some stretch wrap to hold them together. In pairs, they're still kind of light to move around, but it limits the number of individual things we have to deal with. Maybe put three of them together if it's a smaller size. Uh, so for these long clamps, in some cases, especially the really long ones, there's really not a whole lot you can do other than move the bundle and then that goes into a moving truck. Um, for the ones that are not super long, we actually can put them in things like a garbage can. So if you have uh, shop garbage cans, just don't put so many that you tip it over. Uh, you can actually fill that up. And if you're lucky enough to have it on wheels, you can just push it around and it rolls fairly easily. For things like the F-style clamps, uh, again, those are they're small, but they're gonna get heavy. And I wouldn't necessarily wanna put the heavier ones in a box. If you happen to have some buckets, that's a great place to put them. Buckets are really strong, they're durable, they got a nice handle, and uh, if you got a whole bunch of pickle buckets like I do, those can really come in handy. So my editor Todd came all the way up from Texas to help me with the packing. At this point, I really needed the extra manpower, and it doesn't hurt that he's like 6'5". Now there are few more challenging installations in a hobbyist wood shop than mounting an air cleaner to the ceiling by yourself. And taking one down can be just as scary. But using Lifty McLift Face and the Tall Texan, it was almost trivial. To help make room for the garage door installers, we took down a few additional lengths of ductwork. Right, so I finally did get a garage door company to respond. <laughs> Gave me an estimate, decent price, and they got to work. And the rails are back in place, the openers are back in place and we now have two operational, well technically three operational garage doors. I don't love it, but it had to be done. Ugh, gross. Get my supremacy! <laughs> they just don't make villains like they used to. Walk into the shot. Yep, you are the shot. No. <laughs> and look. Mm -hmm. Um, sad plus sad equals happy scissors. Sad plus sad equals happy scissors. <laughs>